I've gotten to that wonderful, wonderful position where I can actually pick my clients and I can, I don't have to work as hard on my publicity because I have a bunch of very loyal people, which is absolutely wonderful. I'm very grateful for that. How long did it take to get to the point, that point with your business? About a year. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Keep it nerdy. Keep it nerdy. Keep it real. Nerdpreneur, you know I love my work. Life's a game, so I'ma take my turn. Nerds deserve to put their passion first, so let them rap a verse so they can all be heard. I am a small, independent board game designer. We are dice retailers. <laughs> Correct. I'm a breeder of tarantulas, uh, importing tarantulas and some other critters. I am a harpist. I do mainly Celtic harp, video game songs, um, songs from nerdy TV shows. I connected my love for close-up magic with being a scare actor. Nerdpreneur, you know Welcome to Nerdpreneur. This is where we have conversations with nerds making money with their nerdy passion. And as always, I am joined by my co-host Frank. Hello. Welcome, Frank. And we have a amazing uh, guest for you today. Her name is JJ, and she is a freelance digital artist. Hi. Uh, thanks for coming on the show. We appreciate you being here. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about what is your your nerdy passion and how did you discover it? Well, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, my nerdy passion basically is uh, drawing and uh, coming up with graphic concepts to uh, help storytelling. Um, so that's that's a very general vibe that encompasses you know, illustrating books or coming up with concepts for animation or for characters and sometimes just helping out people who have an idea in their head and know how to put it into words but need somebody to put it into colors and shape. That's cool. I, I'm guessing that if somebody has, for example, a D&D character or a concept for their uh, character and they can articulate it, you can help them actually bring that to life in terms of a visual. Yeah, and some people have the complete inability to project visuals in their mind. Like, if you describe a blue fowler to them, they just don't see it. They, they understand the word, but they don't have a visual for it unless you actually put it there. From a physiological standpoint, it is the inability of some neuronal, uh, neural synapses to connect with each other. And did you say fowler? Flower, sorry. Flower, okay. I was like trying to figure out what it was. Flower, all right. Maybe it's just on my <laughs> mic. You're in Australia, so I thought maybe that was something of a slang down there that we didn't know. Turns out I just have bad hearing. Or I have poor pronunciations <laughs> as well. <laughs> I could see Fowler being an insult. Kind of, I mean, it's like a play on the words of foul, like the bird. Yeah. But also something that is foul to behold. It could have a very Shakespearean take on it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, especially a blue fowler. A blue fowler must be like some sort of blue peacocky bird that we've never seen before. That's what I was thinking. So yeah, it's like the very extreme mocking jay kind of. A... <laughs> yeah, or there's like midnight yeah. cockatoos, you know, <laughs> that I had never heard of, and they're like they've got like little white specks that look like stars on them. I was like, I, yeah. I thought this was someone photoshopped this, but that's a real thing. No, yeah, they're beautiful. Nature's yeah, awesome. Gorgeous birds. So have you always been an artist? Is this always been like, man, when you started, when you were in grade school, you were drawing and loving it? Or did this become something you emerged later? Even right out of the womb, did that happen? Or is it just like <laughs> you came out of the womb with a pencil set of color? Yeah, they had, they had to take me out. You know, they had to give it my mom a C-section because I was holding on to so many paintbrushes <laughs> and pencils and... And like they're like, what if what if the pot of paint spills in there? That could get really messy. Let's just cut it out. <laughs> yeah, the easel would be tough. <laughs> but yeah, um, when did that start for you? It it started right away because I I was extremely blessed with having an extremely rich cultural education right from the start. Um, my mom really made a point of taking me to museums. So, you know, when other little kids were like, oh, museums, it's boring, I was the one leading the charge and getting super psyched up and excited. Um, she told me that, like, the, my awakening was at four year old, where um, she took me to the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And apparently, we spent four hours in there 
with me going from piece to piece to piece, just out loud, telling her what I saw and what I thought the artist was trying to do and why it was this, this color and this shape and why it was that way. Um, and apparently the whole visit, two older ladies from the Bronx who spoke French followed us and like just had their visit with a four-year-old leading the charge and explaining the world of art to them. Wow, that's awesome. And at the end, they came and gave me a candy and told me that, you know, I had a really good mind. I was like, oh. <laughs> Through a child's eyes, that is so cool. I mean, that would be, I don't, I don't blame those two ladies. That would be really interesting. You know, who knows? Maybe they were high, but... <laughs> At least I had a good That's time. fair too. That, that tends to be the way I like to go through art galleries. It's a little bit toasted. What I'm curious is like, you know, you, you've been, it sounds like uh, drawing, painting, like doing art from the get go. Was it something you said, oh man, that's definitely what I'm going to do for my life and I want to become a professional at this? Or was it something that emerged later on through some sort of experience? It started that way because I was always the annoying kid in class not listening and drawing. So at some point my teachers were like, you know, you might as well try to make a living out of that because <laughs> <laughs> okay, go away, please. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, my mom insisted on me pursuing art, so uh, straight out of high school, I uh, got into um, the uh, China Academy of Fine Art in Beijing, Whoa. which is like the most prestigious art school in Asia, it's the largest campus in Asia, it's like crazy, super high technical. And I was very lucky there, I got uh, uh, one of the masters, uh, Master He Yu, took me under his wing, and basically I was doing normal classes from 8 to 12. And then from 1 to 8 p.m., I was in his studio learning his techniques and being trained one-on-one -on -one by him. Sorry, 1 to win? Like 1 p.m. to win? To 8 p.m. Wow. Yeah, I was doing 8 to 8 uni, uni days. Monday to Friday. Nonstop. Oh, my God. <laughs> that is so cool. I mean, I was trying to think, like, what's the closest thing I've ever done like that? And I guess in <laughs> high school, I did something like that, but it wasn't every day of the week. This is a thing that I've always been curious about. This is technique, and this sounds very much like drill for skill, right? Like you were, like, can you walk us through when you were sitting down with this master and working for roughly eight hours a day, right? Uh, with them personally, one on one, what are you doing? So it, it sounds very romantic and epic in saying. Uh, the reality is that you spend hours and hours drawing the same thing and restarting over and over and over. Basically, he, he expected nothing but perfection. So it's really the ability to translate exactly what you see on paper. There's no room for mistakes. So one of my first exercises was I had to draw a, a block of sculpted marble, like the, the top of a Greek column kind of a thing. So it had lots of, you know, uh, architectural elements and I had to respect the proportions and my lines had to be straight. Mm -hmm. And I think I had to redraw that thing in total, something like 43 times to get it right. Because, mm. yeah, anytime my proportions weren't right, you know, he would just come over, look and say, that's wrong. Shh, do it again. Wow. So people listening not everyone's going to have had that kind of an experience and so for people who you know have a different background i'm sure they're curious you know what what value what benefits do you find looking back you know this was you know at least 10 years ago so looking back having that kind of time wow, to reflect thanks. thanks for drilling my age like that like that was at least was 10 say, years man. ago just <laughs> Uh, I didn't even know how to approach that. So I just chose that sentence and here we are. But since you've had this kind of, you've had all this time to reflect. No, but since you've oh had some time God. to reflect. I'm going to hang you... up now. Thanks. Bye. <laughs> this with, has been with... the Nerdpreneur podcast and we are <laughs> yeah. done. All right. <laughs> with, with this chance to reflect, what is what are some of the values that, that you see like, wow, I really gained this. Um, and and then, you know, the step on top of that is what are some ways that people can get that without going to such a, you know, a wonderful, prestigious opportunity? It is the boring part of art. Um, when we think of art, we think of creativity and inspiration and, you know, great masters like Salvador Dali or Picasso who went with completely different styles and invented actual new artistic movements. But the very basis of it is that you can't become a master of creation until you've mastered what already exists. And for that, you need to have perfect control of your hand, 
have perfect control and understanding of how light and shadow work, what is color coding, what is the theory of colors, what does perspective does to things. And, you know, even studying human anatomy allows you then to push the limits of it and create really cool monsters. A monster is a lot cooler when the anatomy actually makes sense, when the muscles look like they belong where they are and they're actually attached to bone. Because if you don't have that basic knowledge, it's very hard then to make something that can be accepted by other people's mind. I am very lucky that I got a formal education in that, but like I don't see it as something superior as compared to someone who was self-taught. As long as you go out there and actually seek the knowledge and draw from real life, that is exactly the same. Like, truly, I, I went to school, but my teachers didn't tell me much except for that's right. wrong, that's right. It was just drilling all day. Right. Yeah, that repetition. I see. I see what you mean. That's really, as someone who has very little, like, uh, pen to paper kind of art skill and when it comes to drawing a visual, um, that's, that's interesting to hear. It, it personally really, really ticks me off when people tell me, oh, you know, you have such a gift. There is no gift. No right. one was born with talent. No one. It's right. all hard work and practice and researching. It's telling an artist that they have a gift is actually pooping on the endless hours of effort they've put into their own education and their own training. Right. It's all under the surface. What people think is easy is never easy. Yeah. Like the duck under the the duck on the water. It seems easy, but like underneath all of this work is happening that no one sees. Yeah. Let's flash forward many, many, many years. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, I'm just joking. But wow. Like, okay. Like, okay. We're doing this. Oh, We're doing this. I see. Welcome, JJ. <laughs> no, let's just flash forward to let's say current day, but you probably are familiar with the 10,000 hour rule around creating mastery, right? Is that if you put 10,000 hours into a practice, it becomes something that you can just do. And that's where you get to that mastery level. Um, and it sounds to me like if you add up, you know, eight hours a day working on form, working on these fundamentals of art, how is that translated for you now into what you do currently? Because I know we kind of just said it off the top of our podcast. I'm a freelance digital artist. Like, what does that mean? And what do you actually do now? So now I've completely let go of the um, classic medium of painting and um I, I still sketch, but just as an exercise, not for, not as part of my business. I now draw on a digital tablet uh, from the brand Cintiq. It's very different because it's drawing on the screen. Uh, it's training your eye and your hand synchronicity to really adopt a new rhythm. My former training in understanding how shadow and light works, etc., allows me to then work directly on the tablet and be able to bring more realistic colors and more realistic takes on sometimes completely fantasy or science fiction um, characters or elements. So what I do now is I illustrate children's book. I uh, do a lot of storyboarding, which is translating a, um, a script from a TV show, an animation, a movie into actual images, like a little short, a rough comic book of what the movie is going to look like. It's also coming up with character concepts for the same TV shows and movies, you know, saying, oh, the main character is a really cool dark guy. It's like, okay, but you got to help your casting director. What, what does the really cool dark guy look? What do you mean dark? Is it skin color? Are we talking vibe? Are we talking eyes? Are we talking, you know, Mysterious. Is, does he wear edgy <laughs> clothing? Exactly. So then it's my job to take the notes from the director and bring that character to life, or at least bring a first drawing, a first splash of, okay, this is, this is the vibe we're going with. So does this mean that you have like a, a job with like a company that's hiring you and you, and they send you concepts, or is this more of like, you're finding your own clients and it's all like kind of gigs, that kind of thing. So the reality is that it's a little bit of both. Um, I do have uh, two studios that I work with regularly that really appreciate my my speed and my delivery um, and uh, they keep coming back to me with different concepts and different projects and then when work is a little bit more slow uh, then I have to prop up other clients send my portfolio or post online that my commissions are open and I'm, I'm looking for clients. There's so many people 
in the D&D space that are artists and probably are, you know, what you would consider amateur, but just because they're not necessarily getting paid regularly, yeah. doesn't mean they're not good. They're probably, they, there are many great, great talented artists out there, but just aren't necessarily finding a way to make money with that. Absolutely. Let me ask you, what really matters to say a company in your industry? Top three things, because that's probably really hard. <laughs> in the con you mean in the context of studios or in the context of private people commissioning me? I feel like we should talk about both. But what, what, what I guess what I noticed was when you talked about the companies, they really appreciate the speed of which I create. Like, okay, that right there to me tells me right. you're providing something unique in terms of value for them. And I'm really curious as to what's outside the talent and skill that you've developed as an artist that really makes uh, your business successful versus others. Well, one, I would say the very first value that has made a difference in my business profile with big studios is my ability to communicate. Mm. After my art studies, I did uh, a master's, a bachelor and a master's in uh, international project management. And during that education, I learned, you know, just how to communicate with your teams, how to respect hierarchy or how to install a flat hierarchy and really how to be a proactive member in a project that's ongoing. And I can see that's making the difference because I'm always organized. I always present an organized front and I always address every issue in a very calm and very nonviolent communication way with my producers. You know, there has been some times where I could feel the tone of the room was a little weird. And instead of just, Ooh, I'm a little scared of that. I'm just gonna pretend it's not there and hope that it goes away. I would then send them a private message say, Hey, when you, when you're available, could we have a private chat on the phone and then just simply address them. I acknowledge that there was a bit of a tense vibe. I want to know if that, if I was responsible for it, how can I change that? How can I make you more comfortable? What was the issue? Can, is it something that I can change? Is it something that you do not wish to discuss and that it's just going to pass mm. really share all of my concerns. If someone suggests an idea that I know is stupid and is not going to work to have that skill of letting them know, you know, maybe we could try this, but in that way so that it would put this forward instead of that. Cause I am scared that it's going to confuse the audience with this instead of, wow, oh, yeah, that's shit. I don't want to do that. Of course, that makes so much sense. And I imagine you're probably dealing in some ways with fairly personal ideas that people are, because they're creatively using their creative muscles to put things out there that they want to see become something in the world. And you're the vehicle for that. You're almost, it's almost like they're handing their heart over to you and you have to treat it with a level of respect so that uh, they want to keep working with you. Absolutely. It's, I always, thank my clients for trusting me with their ideas because that's that is what this whole thing is building on it is trust of you know i am giving you my baby and now you have to put it in a good school huh. and i trust you with that and uh, yeah it's it's very delicate because you're also playing you're also on the field with people's ego um mm -hmm. when you're a very creative person like i am if you bring ideas that are different even if there are good ideas, it can hurt the person who had the original concept because they'll be like, why didn't I think of that? Mm -hmm. why, did, why, why is this person seeing things that I'm not seeing? And sometimes it's just because there are another set of eyes that are new to your project, but it can be very hard to accept. And so it's so important to have a very gentle and positive communication. Someone listening to this could repeat it back and, and listen to it with, instead of it, it for it being a collaborative storytelling art experience. I mean, there's so much of this communication that's so important when you're working with people, you know, collaboratively storytelling, whether it's Dungeons and Dragons or it's Starfinder or it's some other RPG, you know, whatever it is, you know, even because someone who creates their story as the dungeon master or homebrews it or a game master, they are going to be trusting the other players. It's like, okay, I'm trusting you to come into this world that I have built the story that I've put together that I'm in love with. And I'm going to trust you to like rampage around like crazy toddlers, <laughs> drunk toddlers. 
And uh, unfortunately, sometimes people don't really recognize that. And so you have to pull them aside. That so never like, happens. What are you talking yeah, about? Yeah, I know, right. People always treat everything you create with respect. Every, and they never kill an important character. Every, they never do oh that. Who have every you been group. playing with, Frank? <laughs> Both of you people, in fact. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's funny because every group, every group, you know, I think everybody could connect to that. You know, it's that importance of communication. And I, yeah. I just love that it came up here with, with your line of work and how that is like the first thing you mention that, it, that this is the first most important thing for your customers. It's not like nerds are ever sensitive either about their projects. <laughs> no, no, no. Hard rock. <laughs> That was that was great. I, I really appreciate you sharing that because I think that a lot of people think that, oh, I just have to be a good artist and then I'll be successful in art and business. And that is, I, I know that's not the case. It's a myth. And so I'm really curious, like beyond the art skills, are there any other skills that people who want to get serious into this type of industry should work on? There's a difference between a good, being a good artist and being a successful artist. Being successful, if you want to define it by, you know, your ability to make a living out of it and... Unfortunately, how many followers you get on Instagram and stuff like that. It's not enough to be good at what you do. There's plenty of amazing artists out there that do crazy, crazy realism with the most amazing skills I've ever seen, much better than me, but that just don't have an audience because they don't know how to navigate the current tools. So communication was the very, the, the most important skill, at least to me, because um, I insist on being respectful of my clients and their ideas, but also being respected as an artist. There's a lot of people online who think that because it's online, they don't need to have basic manners. If I have a client that comes to me who, you know, doesn't say hello, doesn't say please or thank you, doesn't talk to me like I'm a human being, I tend to tell them, look, um, this is an issue for me. Could you please address me normally? And if they tell me to fuck off, then I'm like, well, you know what? I actually don't need your character. I have people on a waiting list, so bye. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, amongst the other ones, uh, the other skills to be successful, to have to make a living, it's organization, uh, knowing your own limits, not don't take more than you can actually chew, and uh, and yeah, and unfortunately, following up with social media because that is where it's at now that is how you get clients right the majority of my clients now come from instagram and so i have to look you know oh what's the good time on my area to post where what are the good hashtags that will attract people etc and it's it's a pain in the ass this all is under the conglomerate of what we call say marketing right which is yeah. the aspect of getting clients to be interested in what you do and provide value and this is going to be a consistent theme in all of nerdpreneur people because marketing is part of every business and a very important part so get good at marketing people could you is it all right if you elaborate a little bit on what it is that you do with marketing to make that happen and some of the things that make a difference in that sure um so yeah, I think learning how to use social media was a very, very big point for me. So I, I just went online and started reading reports from other companies, just proving, you know, what are the best timeframes to post for that kind of audience. Then I started using the Instagram tools, looking at what's the age group of my audience. What's the majority of my audience? Is it majorly male or female? What age group? What location in the world? So. It turns out that the majority of my audience is male, but not by too much. So I was quite happy with that. I was like, okay, so I, I can play on both sides with that. The age group actually is close to my age. The majority of it is in America. So that allowed me to go, okay, so now I can research what are the hashtags that are looked at by those people? What do those people follow? What time do those people look at their Instagram? Uh, and I had to just adjust my posting with that. So I, now I make posts ahead and I only click on actually posting them out when it's the perfect timeline, um, to hit as many people as possible. How often do you post? Uh, I used to post every day until I got enough regular clients that now I don't feel that I have to do as much effort. I've gotten to that wonderful, wonderful position where I can actually pick my clients and I can. I don't have to work as hard on my publicity because I have a bunch of very loyal people, um, which is absolutely wonderful. I'm very grateful for that. How long did it take to get to the point, that point with your business? About a year. Wow. Yeah. Wow. 
that I hold on. Hold on. We can't just pass over that. Oh, just a, I mean, okay. First off, I honestly thought your answer was going to be, oh, my whole life. You know, that whole, like that, that concept. But, and then you said a, a year. How did you do that? Because that's, that's the truth. The thing is I've been drawing my whole life, but I have never tried to make a business out of it up until a year ago. Uh, so simply because I honestly didn't believe I was good enough for that. I never had someone other than, you know, very close family or, or besties telling me, oh, but you know, you're amazing. It's like, yeah, but your opinion doesn't matter because you're obviously biased. Um, until, until I started playing D and D and, and I started putting stuff out there on a couple of, a, a couple of discord chats and a couple of Instagram feeds. And I've had some people reach out and say, Hey, I really love what you do. Would you be, a, do you take commissions? I was like, oh there's actually people interested in what I do. That's amazing. You found and, an uh, audience. It sounds like you kind of like, I did. I found my tribe. Cause you were, yeah, your tribe. You did just explain how you did a lot of research into your audience, but did you stumble onto this before you did that research? No. So no, you just, you did, you did, you pursued it and then people yeah. started to, and then you were like, Hey, I, I hit the mark. Right. Yeah. It's, it's really when I decided to, fully invest myself in it and you know for organization i i put some money into uh, an actual software to help me with accounting to create proper invoices to log in the time that i spend on every part project to see if oh okay this person i'm giving them a discount because of that that means that impacts me this way and this way and then i can see my revenue and how much i'm spending on you know the software the internet how much i'm spending on keeping up with my equipment and then how much I'm gaining. And I started creating plannings in my head of, all right, I need to spend at least an hour per day researching the marketing around digital arts to see what, what works and what I need to do. Was there ever a time where you were like, this is too hard. I want to quit. Every day when I wake up, dude. <laughs> Every day. <laughs> I thought that might be the answer because I, I feel like there's a lot of people out there that wonder if I have those feelings, should I just quit? Because the people who are successful clearly never have those feelings. And I just know it's like a battle with yourself every single time you get out there to do what's right for your business and building it and moving it in the right direction. And I think that that is so apparent, at least the way you're describing it, even in the doubt before getting onto social media or getting yourself out there to get that first client about like, am I really good enough to do this? Who am I to charge for my art? Do you have any advice for people who, if they're on that place where they're like, should I do this? Am I not? Like, do you have any advice for people in that situation? It's something I learned in school. It's um, just do an MVP, a minimal vile product. Put something out there that doesn't cost you anything, doesn't require any personal investment other than your time, and see what the fuck happens. Find a Facebook group that has a couple of D&D artists or people looking for artists, and post a couple of your drawings and say, hey, it just so happens that I draw, and it just so happens that what I enjoy drawing is fantasy-related stuff. And right now, I got time. So if you want your character drawn, I'm willing to do it for 20 bucks, and we'll just see what happens. And if it works, awesome. Keep going at it. Keep upping your price until you get to a point where it's actually viable for you. If it doesn't work, that's okay. Try somewhere else, and keep trying until it actually happens, because our, our greatest threats as um, entrepreneurs are expectations. And my biggest advice is when it comes to creativity and inspiration, go at it with no expectations. That way you can allow yourself to be pleasantly surprised all the time. How do you stay inspired? I myself follow a lot of artists on Instagram. I watch a couple of, you know, sometimes I do tutorial videos and I just watch it. And I'm like, oh my God, that brush looks really cool i want to try it and it's like oh well now i need an idea to actually use the brush okay well i'll do something um sometimes it's watching a movie it's reading a book and going oh that's i'm getting really strong images from this book you know what i'm just i'm just going to draw one of them i'm just just for my own pleasure i'm just going to draw one of them and sometimes i do something that i'm happy with i'm like oh i guess i'll try to post it somewhere and maybe see if there's a fandom for this book and see if other people saw the character the same way i did and then you make connections and you keep 
I try to keep getting small victories. I've, I've managed to get out of mostly of the need of validation for what I do. I don't, I no longer need that person telling me, oh, you know, this is so good. You did a good job. It's more small victories of, okay, today I'm going to try, hmm, I'm going to try drawing blue eyes, but in a very realistic way. I usually make them like crazy blue. And today I'm just going to go for that very slight off gray bluish eye and see if I can get that effect. And I'm going to start looking for references and then I'm going to start getting into it. I'm like, oh, that looks cool. Oh, maybe I'm going to give him a cool skin texture. And if I'm happy with that, I'm like, okay, today my small victory was I did something I've never done before. And that's awesome. And I'm going to keep that for myself and I'm going to celebrate myself for having accomplished that. Nice. So you give yourself praise, that validation, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. I think people sometimes forget that too. At least, I don't know. I definitely had to learn that lesson for myself as I was growing in business and growing in sales is that you have to rely on yourself to make yourself feel good <laughs> because you can't necessarily rely on other people or situations or things outside of you to, uh, to keep you motivated and inspired. So I, I wanted to add, um, sometimes time is also your best friend when it comes to finding that validation, because there are times where I just can't get any drawing on the board, you know, like the, the white page, mm. the horrible haunting moments of, <laughs> I have nothing, nothing I draw looks good. Nothing I draw looks right. I feel like I'm, a, I'm an imposter. I, I am not an artist. I should just shut it all down and go hide in a hole and pet my dog. Mm. And sometimes it's okay to shut down and hide in a hole. And what I usually do when I'm, deep deep in that hole is i go back to the very first posts on my instagram feed and i look through everything that i've done and i look at projects that i'm proud of and i look at things that were surprised myself and sometimes seeing stuff even that when i posted it you know six months ago i was like oh this i'm not very happy with that but i need something for the feed so i'm just gonna post it whatever and sometimes i see it six months later i'm like what the hell was I talking about? This is great. I love it. It has a vibe. It's different. Like I dig this. So yeah, sometimes time actually helps you to not just be objective, but actually discover new praises that you weren't able to give yourself before. It's amazing how you can be in a funk and then you look back and like, well, at least I'm not there anymore. Holy crap. <laughs> I've really come far in comparison to where I started. That's why it's so important just to start, people. You will make progress if you just start. So what I was going to ask her a moment ago was around advice and, you know, what people have given you. Is there some advice that you'd gotten at one point that was just some of the worst advice and you were like, oh, yeah? Oh, okay, go ahead. The worst, at some point, I was really getting serious about illustration. And the worst advice that was repeated to me by a lot of people and including, you know, professionals that were being successful was stick to one style because they all told me on Instagram, the way it works is that people want what they expect from you. So if you start, you know, being too diversified, then they're going to go, what the fuck's going on with this feed? I'm not interested anymore. I only liked it because I liked this particular thing. That was a reference to something I like now that it's going everywhere. I'm not interested anymore. Wow. And a lot of people quote misquoted that saying and told me, you know, oh, you know, jack of all trades, master of none. And the thing is, that's half of the saying. The full saying goes, jack of all trades, master of none, always better than master of one. And that is the biggest skill and selling point that I have for what I do with studios now. It's that I can do so many different styles that I can work on a lot of different mediums that I can do, you know, things for an audience of three to five years old, but I can also do very classical art for your Nana that wants a beautiful, realistic portrait of her cat on her wall. And my ability to go from, you know, cartoon network style to full on Japanese animation to come back to classic fantasy realism from third edition or, you know, even do like wood carving style. That is such a big selling point for my portfolio because yeah. studios look at that, producers look at that and say, oh, that's great. No matter what I need, no matter what project lands in my lap, that girl will be able to do it. And that's great. Damn. Yeah, that, that 
makes total sense. Well, I have a couple of questions in that vein. Um, what what are some of your favorite projects you've worked on? Um, that you can share. That you can share. Yeah, that's, that's that's the big uh, that's the big topic. There's one that should be out now, but unfortunately, we're running late on production, so I still can't talk about it. <laughs> um, that just um, makes people excited to follow you now because they can hear. I know, about it, right? <laughs> Coming very soon, very very soon, something very exciting and very international is going to happen. <laughs> Uh, some of my favorite projects. I have worked a lot for uh, a studio called um, Artists in Motion, who does event animation. Um, they mostly do, you know, uh, projected animations on buildings. And uh, I've been doing a lot of storyboards for these guys. And it's been very, very exciting to work with them because the head of design has allowed me to come in creatively and to actually be part of the conversation. I was valued not just as, you know, a machine that you feed the script and I just poop out images. I was actually being asked for my opinion and for my take and, and my opinion was valued. So that made me feel really good because it made me feel like I could do more. Uh, and, and that it's through this company that I started um, directing as well. It's, it's that particular head of design um, who gave me my chance, who said, you know, I've watched you work. I know you can do it and made me realize, oh, maybe I need to review my own ambitions and aim higher. Yeah. But I've also really, really developed such a strong love for doing D&D characters. Um, I've had some clients that have come to me with amazingly unique concepts. Uh, one that pops to mind is I have this amazing person who commissioned me a couple of times to do their tiefling. Uh, but theirs is a homebrew version that's a void tiefling. So she's got like, her horns are tentacles and she's got a very marine inspired design. And she has two different skins, as you would put it. She has like her normal everyday purple and blue with a lot of cool hues to her skin. And then she has that night mode that can activate when she's in the water and her skin becomes completely see-through and translucent and she has like her veins and her organs become bioluminescent and working on that project not only was really satisfying from a creative standpoint but that person asked me are you familiar with ocean creatures and i used to be a marine biologist assistant and i have a huge <laughs> passion for the ocean um, so for her to tell me she, you know oh what are some cool ocean creatures that you know and i was like oh my god oh <laughs> my god let me get out five thousand pages of research and drawings that i have done in the field while diving let me show you cool shit i still look at those pieces today and go wow i'm i'm so happy with how that turned out i i pulled i actually pulled up your uh, instagram account and for the listeners that want to find these, they are stunning. I mean, you've got a couple different takes on, I mean, like you said, there's the bioluminescent version and then there's the like non-bioluminescent version. And I mean, not a lot of, like you don't do background for all of your commissions. I mean, I can understand why, uh, you know, that's- Because uh, it costs of, extra. <laughs> exactly, it's part of your pricing structure. Uh, but it is just, I mean, the character is just great and the personality and the face, I just, so I just wanted to say, I really love it. And anyone who's curious should really go find it on your Instagram. I'm curious. I just wanted to jump back to uh, getting clients because I, I'm, how does it really work? Is it like, okay, I've posted for a year and now I just have a flood of people coming in and they're asking me for commissions and uh, you get to kind of pick and choose. Is there kind of a tipping point where you know, it's like a slow trickle and then all of a sudden it's like a waterfall of people or is there more is there any active like looking and going out for them or you know i'm just curious if there's anything in there you can highlight about that process um yeah there's uh there are periods in the year where uh it just gets completely insane for artists the pre-christmas period is the number one it's where everyone is getting commissions all the dms are wanting to you know do a, a family portrait for their players all of the players who have a partner who plays D&D are like, oh, I want to get their character done for them and maybe print it on a t-shirt or get a whole pack care package for them around that character. Uh, so pre-Christmas, like from two months before Christmas until New Year's is absolutely nuts. 
this is usually where I have, I get to a point where I have to close my commissions because otherwise my, my waiting list gets completely insane and I can no longer guarantee that I'll be able to deliver before Christmas time. So there's a, there's, there's space in the market for more people to be doing what you're doing. It sounds like too, right? Absolutely. There will always be space. Even, even some of my clients, even some of my recurring clients sometimes will go to other artists just because they want a style that I cannot do. And that's perfectly fine. And I'm, I've, I've referenced other artists to some of my clients before as well, because I've had people come to me and tell me like, oh, I want hyper realism for the armor. I'm like, that's awesome. I, I can't do that. But I know, I know a dude on Instagram who can and who's about the same price range of me. So uh, I'll give you his link and please go for it. Awesome. But yeah, there's, there's periods of up and down and, um, I think one of my best tools to uh, when I do need to find clients uh, is actually Facebook. Facebook groups like all things D and D, D and D art, fantasy stuff like that, where you can just post, "Hey, this is what I do. This is my portfolio. Those are my prices. Hit me up if you want something done." Or sometimes you can even just find people straight up asking on the feed, "Hey, looking for an artist. This is my budget. Can anyone help me?" Yeah. Wow, Facebook still has a use. I know, right? <laughs> it's not just parents and grandparents doing embarrassing things on there and asking you to play Candy Crush with you. <laughs> <laughs> There's actually more. And so uh, do you, in your Instagram, for example, do you just have like a link tree with like, all right, you can hit me up here or do you just wait for DMs to come in? Or is it, you know, what's the best route for people to do that? I, I still entertain. I do have an official website that... It's visited like three times a year, mostly by me, um, but it was just to have a, um, a more professional front, um, something to put on a, on a business card, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was a good exercise also for me in learning how to, how to navigate web design because God, that's a pain. Yeah. Um, it's a lot of work. Yeah, well, I think it it's a stopping point for a lot of people too, is that they're like, well, I can't even get a website, so I'm never going to become a professional artist. Mm. Yeah. Well, Fair warning, uh, I've never gotten a single client through my website, ever. Wow. Do you think, though, that they use it to, like, look you up, but they may not contact you through it? Has anyone ever been like, yeah, I saw your website. That was interesting. Yeah, the only time that I've had people actually use my website was the very rare occasional person who got my email through a, a previous client and who would message me on my email and say, hey, I don't have Instagram. I don't have Facebook. I just don't do social media. Is there anywhere where I can see your portfolio without having to create an account? And that's when I would go, of course, you can, I would refer them to my website, but those are extremely rare. So if someone doesn't have a website, they can still get started on Instagram or platforms like that and you yeah. know, take DMs. You can also put your email in your you know, bio so people can contact you there, that kind of thing. So I just, I just like to get into the nitty gritty for people because I think there's a lot of blocks that people put in front of themselves thinking it needs to be more complicated than it is. Start with a tool that you are comfortable with already so that it doesn't take any extra effort for you. If you're mostly comfortable in Discord, I have gotten a lot of commission through Discord by posting on D&D Beyond, Arts and Crafts feeds or all things D&D or lots of Dungeons and Dragons related um, discords. So yeah, don't be afraid. What are you especially nerdy about outside of your core business? So many things. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, you've mentioned three. Yeah, (laughs) you've mentioned marine biology. Yeah, marine biology, marine biology specifically related to sharks and corals is uh, probably a very, very big one. I am a, an extremely passionate diver. Sharks. That's, I feel like that's an unpopular opinion there. It is very unpopular, but that's why it's a lot of fun because it's a lot of fun to educate people when they're willing to, of course. I'm not, I, I try not to be the annoying nerd that just, <laughs> you know, whenever someone says, oh yeah, I'm so scared of sharks. Well, actually you shouldn't be because... <laughs> Yeah, I right. try not to do that. I always go, would you be interested in hearing more about why they behave like that? Um, yeah. <laughs> most of the time people say no. <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay. Um, I am extremely nerdy of uh, Dungeons and Dragons, of course. It's, a, it's become a huge part of my life and it just brings me joy every day. Um, God, I'm nerdy on dog training, on plant propagation. Uh, 
basically I have a I have a kind of an obsessive tendency. Any hobby that I pick up, I'm gonna start researching the crap out of it until I feel like I've gotten to a level that I'm comfortable having a conversation with someone who's been practicing it for a certain number of years. Yeah, I, it's very easy for me to turn things into obsessions. That's a great standard to have, actually, you know, if, you know, being able to hold a conversation with someone who's been doing this for a number of years. That's that's great. As opposed to like, some people go down the rabbit hole, and they just don't know when to stop, like myself. I mean, sometimes you don't, sometimes you don't need to stop. Sometimes it's a good thing that you don't stop because that's how hobbies become passions and passions yeah, then right. become craft. And then you end up being interviewed on Nerdpreneurs. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it can happen to you, people. It can happen to you. <laughs> if you had a million followers, what advice would you give them? God, um, what are you doing? <laughs> uh, no, I would, I would stick to... Um, the one that I said at the beginning, approach passions without expectations. If it is your passion, if it's something that brings you joy, then the only important thing is that it continues to bring you joy. And that's okay. And it doesn't have to please anyone else. It doesn't have to make money to be good for you. One of the things that I love about what you know, you've been saying is that pretty much so much of what you've done is stuff that you have intentionally and actively done. There's none of this like waiting around for shit to happen. There is this, this, um, I, I did it in a year because I pursued it like hell as an artist. I definitely had that time of like, yeah, you know, something's going to come along and I'll be ready for it. And it was like that, you know, I thought that that was proactive, that I would be ready when something came along. And it was like, no, you got to go make it happen. Yeah, it's it's not about grabbing opportunities. It's about creating them. You yeah. have to create your own opportunities. And I, I, you know what? I learned that from my dad who, um, when he was 18, thought he wanted to become a photographer. And um, he, he was really bad. Like he, his parents gave him money to pay for med school and he took that money and actually bought himself a really good camera and just started taking pictures out there. <laughs> so don't follow that example. But um, he wanted desperately to work for uh, National Geographic and wow. he sent them his portfolio and they said no. He was like, oh, okay, well, <laughs> actually, I'm not okay with that. I, I want to work for you guys. So every day he showed up to their offices until they just wanted to get rid of him and said, okay, fine, just, oh my God, just take this project, just do it. If you do a good job, we'll pay you. Otherwise you have to promise never to come back. And he was like, yep, yeah, sweet. And it didn't turn out great, so it didn't happen, but at least he got his shot. Wow, that's tenacity right there. Persistence is power. It's, sometimes it's about persistence, sometimes it's about how much gut you have. Yeah. How much, in French we call it le culot, it's how much, how much audacity you're going to have showing up to someone that's way out of your pay grade and go, hey, you know, I do stuff. Do you want to see? Do you want to see me do stuff? And the confidence, <laughs> right? Like there's, there's a level of self-confidence and self-belief that goes along with that, that you create your shots, but then you need to be able to deliver on those shots that you provide for yourself and you believe that you can. I will say that there's two ways you can approach that. You can approach that with confidence or you can approach that with brutal honesty. You can also go at it like that's, that's how I got the directing job. I, I was brutally honest to the head of design and just said, I've never directed before. I have a lot of ideas, but I have no training and no freaking clue how that works. So I'm going to need your guidance through this. And I'm going to need you to tell me if I'm doing something wrong. I will be very open to criticism and I'm going to research the crap out of it. And I'm going to try my very best to do it the right way. But I, I cannot tell you that it's going to go well and it's going to be perfect because I don't know. But I'm super excited. I am super grateful for the opportunity. And I promise you that I'm going to treat this as if it was my own baby. Yeah, that's super telling of, I think, our, I, I want to say our generation because that's all I can really speak for. but. As far as you, people are more interested in your attitude around it and your like your personality when it comes to like work ethic, as opposed to whether you have the experience. The experience is great and that, that it means a lot, but if they like you as a person and working with you, that can go so far. Yeah. And you know what? I, I got, I got 
a job from another animation studio that is like one of the largest production companies in Australia because I did an audition with them where I had to draw um, a storyboard based on a script. So the first part was I had to correct, edit a storyboard that was already done with, that had director's notes on it. And then the last part, I just had to draw the whole thing by myself. And of course you had to do it as fast as possible. And they asked me to do it on a program, on a software that I had never tried before. Oh, wow. And instead of saying, you know, oh, sure, yeah, I can do it, no problem. I was brutally honest and said, I'm going to have to learn it. I'm going to have to watch a couple of tutorials, but no problem, I'll do it. And because I delivered very quickly of good quality, even though I didn't know the tool at all, and it, they saw that I was able to teach myself how to use that tool in less than three days. Oh, okay, there's trainable, and then there's this girl that can just slam a whole new software in three days. That's awesome. That means, wow. that means where I lacked experience, they already knew that I could make up for it with teachability. Yeah. That's so huge. That's awesome. Do you want to do, you want to do the random roll question? Yeah, uh, let's do it. I know you usually introduce that one. Yeah, so here's where things are a little less serious and a lot more fun, at least uh, I, I, for me. For me, they <laughs> probably will be for you as well. But so what we're going to do is you're going to roll a D100. Uh, we're going to okay. do this about three times, uh, but we'll do one at a time. But just so you know, uh, these are uh, some questions that will be determined based on your roll. So go ahead and give oh. me the first one if you... I'm sorry, yeah. I forgot oh, yeah, to prepare gonna... my dice. Let me just grab... because I, I have. You have to bless have... them and all that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I also did get, you know, new fancy dice for Christmas, so of course... Well, you got you to explain and describe them a little bit. I know. I got some absolutely magical dichroic glass dice. Oh, they're glass? Yeah, they're made of glass, but it's like, it's like a prism. They oh, refract cool. the light and lots of... They look like actual wizard dice, which is awesome. That sounds Whoa. wicked. I'm going to, okay, I'm going to talk to our dice sponsor about if they got those. And if they do, <laughs> we're going we're gonna to promote the heck out of that because that's, that's, uh, that's very, very cool. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, D100. Yep. Go for it. All right. Uh, oh, 101. Uh, or what? one? 101 That's... on a D100? So I guess that was, no, I guess that was an 11. That was an 11. There okay, we go. all right, I'm 11. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> if you could heighten one sense but lose another, which two would you choose? Um. That is really, really, really tricky. Especially as an artist, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There are some things that I can't afford to lose. Um, I guess I would lose my sense of smell. But if I can keep my taste, at least it's okay. Because right. food is life, guys. Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. That's another thing I'm extremely nerdy about. <laughs> uh, and I guess I would heighten my vision. I wonder, I wonder if you could heighten your taste enough to where it would make up for your smell, kind of like snakes. Isn't that the situation for snakes where their their I taste so. is so heightened that that's how they smell? Yeah, they smell with their tongue, basically. I think I think that's hard. That sounds familiar. It sounds right. Someone will correct us, and that'll be good. <laughs> that'll be educational. I'll appreciate that. All right, let's do another D100. Yeah, let's go see. ahead. Roll another D100, please. So that's uh, 51. Okay, if you got the Beth choice to explore the Rick and Morty universe, would you take it? Do you know what that Beth choice is? Um, unfortunately, I have never watched Rick and Morty. Me but... neither. Okay, well, the Beth choice is, all right, we get to give you uh, a clone robot of you that just takes over your life and exactly mimics who you are. But the real you gets a portal gun and all the possibility in the universe to go explore various galaxies and go anywhere else in the universe and do that. Would you take that choice? Would I have the opportunity to then come back to my normal life or is, do I have to explore forever? Uh, you don't have to explore forever. Uh, Beth can come and go as much as she wants, but essentially you, uh, you have the, all the possibility of the universe, but it does take away time in your life, right? Because you have limited time. So. Um, hmm, that's a good question. I don't think so, actually. There is, I, I do have the curiosity for it, but at the same time, approaching it from an extremely logical mind aspect, 
the odds of me surviving multiple universes are pretty small. And I'm actually pretty happy with the life that I have now and the people that are around me. And I would hate for them to live a life surrounded well with me as a robot. Like, I don't. I don't think I would be. I don't think I would be willing to um, to risk the life that I have right now just for the satisfaction of curiosity. I'm really glad that question came up because it's the first time that question has come up. And one of the reasons I put it in there is because I think if we're interviewing people who really like their life and are pursuing their passion, that question will be harder for them to say, yeah, totally, I want to leave. Oh, you what though? I would sell that portal gun. <laughs> yeah, make some money, right? <laughs> to, the, to, to the Stone Super Collider team in Switzerland. And then, uh, yeah, buy myself a nice villa and, uh, you know, live the life. <laughs> wow. Why not? Should we do one more or should we move to rapid fire? Let's do rapid fire. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. These are rapid fire questions. So we'll, it'll be things like, uh, you know, DC or Marvel. And you'll just say which one you like more or, you know, we don't need long answers, just quick ones. Quick and silly. Laser tag or paintball? Laser tag. Star Wars or Star Trek? Star Wars. How dare you? God. <laughs> <laughs> Role playing or combat? Role playing. Coffee or tea? Oh, that's too hard. <laughs> ah, tea. Who is more evil, Dolores Umbridge or Voldemort? Dolores Umbridge. <laughs> she really is evil. <laughs> She's terrible. <laughs> no, that's hilarious. All right. Favorite meal? Breakfast, lunch, or dinner? Oh, dinner. Dinner? Mm. Okay. Well, Hi. Wait, everyone Don't says breakfast. I, I, I never say breakfast. Brunch is the best meal. Oh hands God. down. That wasn't one of the options I gave. So that <laughs> that's. He hey. keeps cutting brunch. Brunch is a valid answer to that question, no matter what. <laughs> Dinner, though. Okay. Typically, people have a dish in mind. Yes, I have to hold the phone here because typically people have a dish in mind when they answer this. So. Like people say breakfast, I love me some scrambled eggs or whatever it is. So what is it in the dinner menu that you're just like, God, that's my favorite. Because breakfast usually only includes one central element, whereas lunch and dinner includes, at least for my French mind, an, a starter, an entree, a main, a dessert. And I live for desserts, but I absolutely freaking love mains as well. And I get a lot of joy from cute little starters like finger sandwiches and shit like that. And on top of that, dinner is usually the meal where you have the highest likelihood of having the whole family around the table. And to me, the social aspect of food is very important. So I'll say dinner. Wow. I, that, that answer just makes me feel so wholesome. Like hearing, hearing those, it's just like, oh my God, it's so true. You just convinced me. It's my favorite <laughs> meal now. Wow. Oh, it's making me teary. Step onto the dark side. <laughs> yes, the dinner side. <laughs> How many cats is too many cats? Um, anything more than three. Um, I want to know, this isn't on our list, but since you said Star Wars was your preferred over Star Trek, what's your least favorite movie? Oh, my least favorite movie. Well, it's hard because I haven't seen all of the new ones because I gave up at some point. Mm-hmm. Even Disney did. Yeah. Yeah. I think honestly, it, uh, it, it probably was the, the first new one that came out. It felt like a, it felt like Star Wars for dummies. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that was the beginning of the end to me. It, it was, it, I, I came out of there like, oh, my favorite franchise is dead. Oh, well, that mm. sucks. It's been changed a lot. <laughs> How do you feel about The Mandalorian and Boba Fett? Have you watched that? I really struggled with season one of Mandalorian, um, but I had so many friends telling me that it picked up afterwards that I gave it a second shot. I was entertained by season two. It wasn't like crazy good, but at least I was entertained. Mm -hmm. uh, Book of Boba Fett is just not doing it for me. I'm actually, it feels, the best way I can describe the sensation when watching it, it feels like Sunday cartoons when you're a kid. Like you're glad, you're glad it's still cartoons, but it's nowhere near the level of the ones that you get on prime time when you come back from school. Mm, yeah. So, yeah, that's that. It's like, oh, I'm glad it's the Star Wars universe and it's a bit gritty, but 
I'm just not. I kind of, I don't know. I've, I've been watching it, and honestly, I really enjoy the uh, the Mandalorian and the Boba Fett one, but I think I just enjoy desert stuff. So anything that's in a desert planet, I'm kind of into, and also it's all, like, gangster-related stuff. I don't know. That's right up my alley for some reason. You really are. You really are. That's just where I like to live in my fantasy worlds is, like, deserts and gangsters and, Mad like, Max you know, Dune. Mad Max, all of that. That's just my wheelhouse. I'm going to I'm gonna assume that June left you with the biggest nerdgasm ever? I may have written a rap song about it and okay. uh, <laughs> produced that and put it out uh, in the anticipation of the movie. I may have uh, done a few <laughs> obsessive things with Dune and may have also dragged many people to it that were not that into it at all, but now they are equally not into it, but they sat through it. Yeah, Nerdgasm's putting it lightly. He had more of, he, he had a forced orgy that's more of what it was, where he just said, the, "These people are going to join me. Dude, it's going to awesome. be fun." <laughs> I'm so I'm so happy. I still think it's it should win an Oscar from the soundtrack right through till everything that was done about it. And yeah, it's awesome. If I may, from both soundtracks, yeah, because the alternative one is just as amazing. Yeah, I mean, Hans Zimmer is just like next level on that he should get an oscar for this hands down that's my opinion i don't think any other movie like if he if it hadn't been for the music the movie would not have been as good just like john williams did for the original star wars like it he did that for this dune movie and i recognize that it's very much like a hans zimmer selling this whole thing uh in many ways combined with the beautiful shots of course you know villeneuve did a great job but without that soundtrack, the whole thing would have flopped. So, And, I mean, I'm obviously biased, but I have to point out also the quality of the concepts designs are oh, amazing. Yeah. Because to me, that's the very first time in my life that I'm watching sci-fi. And I don't feel like it's a copy of a copy of a copy. Mm. I felt like every, every spaceship, every suit, every yeah. armor, I was like, that's new. And I believe yeah. that's futuristic. It didn't feel like a fucking Marvel movie. It didn't feel like Star Wars. It didn't feel like every other big blockbuster movie that has come out in the last 10 years that I stopped going to the movies to see. It felt new in so many ways that I was just so excited. So I I have to completely back you up on that one with the concept artist because that's where it starts and it was next level, so... Go see Dune, everyone. All right. Now. Um, <laughs> oh, my God. If he, He's closing the episodes out with that every time. <laughs> Sorry. We're going to have to cut that on a couple of these, Chris. This will all get cut. Don't worry. Oh, um, my God. But what won't get cut is our last little bit here with you. Where can people, JJ, go support you, find you, uh, and even, you know, potentially hire you? For the general public, I can be found on Instagram at JJ Art Creation singular. Shoot me a DM. Sometimes it takes me a little bit to uh, answer, but I try to check it at least once a day. So um, always glad to start up a chat, even if it's not commission related, even if you just want some advice or want to, uh, you know, do a, an art exchange. I'm always up for those. Um, I'm also on Twitter, but I really suck at that. So the feed is very often inactive for multiple months. So don't expect too much out of me. But, but you it can is contact you. Me. But it is me. And you can contact me through it. Uh, same thing at uh, JJ Art Creation. Um, you can find me on my website, jjartcreation.com. Super easy. And uh, of course, you can support me uh, through Patreon. Uh, Patreon slash JJ Art Creation. You can get behind the scenes little peeks. Um, you get first preview of all of my work. You get big announcements on all the projects that I'm working on, as far as much as I'm allowed to uh, to talk about. Right. Um, and uh, I'm trying to get back into um, helping out the artists that support me by um, every month giving a couple of uh, poses. Uh, pre-drawn that people can just download and then use as a base to draw on um, for their own exercises. Um, oh, and I, is that, I'm unfamiliar with that. Is that kind of like a, you know, you give them the outline so they can color it in like a coloring book? Um, no, not as much. It really is more for beginner artists that struggle with human proportions. And I basically oh. just give them uh, a simple body, a simple humanoid body with no facial features. Uh, that are in different positions or with different angles that they can then use to 
add clothing on and do the hair, do the facial expression and just use as a base for them to um, get better at um, and just, yeah, get uh, get inspiration. I'm, I'm not always very regular on that, but if I get called out on it, uh, I, I do post it. Um, and uh, yeah, and I'm looking into uh, trying to start doing video tutorials, but uh, that's a bit of a way down the line because I still have to teach myself how to do that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for doing this. And also let's just sign off with like, I don't know, stay epic everybody and <laughs> be nerdpreneurs. We're still figuring out our sign off. I don't know what you're being. nerdy and find and pursue those passions. Oh, JJ, what was it you said about like, instead of being ready for it to come to you, it's, it's about going out and making that opportunity happen. Opportunities are, are created. They're self-created. They don't fall in your lap. Yes. Opportunities are created. They don't fall in your lap. Ah, I love that. For listening to Nerdpreneur. Be sure to subscribe wherever you found us and leave a review on Apple Podcasts. Every review helps our show grow. You can follow and chat with us on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube at Nerdpreneur Podcast. Nerdpreneur is a labor of passion, and Chris and I would love to keep this thing going. So if you want us to continue making content, you can support us by going to patreon.com forward slash nerdpreneur and become a member of the board. Members of the board get shout outs. They can submit rapid fire questions. They get behind the scenes peeks and we record super fun and valuable content exclusive to our board members. We love all of you nerds. Keep it nerdy. Nerdpreneur, you know I love my work. Life's a game, so I'ma take my turn. Nerds deserve to put the passion first. So let them rap first so they can all be heard.